welcome to Religion Off the Beaten Track with Robin Douglas, a podcast on the lesser known aspects of religion and belief. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Religion Off the Beaten Track. I'm your host, Robin Douglas, and today we're joined by Alex Sawacki, who is a PhD candidate in medieval literature at Rochester University in New York State. Alex, welcome, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Now, you're what we might call an expert on ghosts, aren't you? I try to be. Ghosts and Catholicism, I think, in in particular. Yes, especially in the high and late Middle Ages. That's my particular area of study. Okay. And by by way of background, how did your research end up going in in this direction? I found myself gravitating towards more of the study of the supernatural, the odd and the uncanny, and ghosts are such a perfect emblem of that. Um, Also, I think I watched the film Ghostbusters too many times as a child, and there was probably some knock-on effects from that. Okay. And um, for, for, for these purposes, what, what exactly is a ghost? So in the text that we'll be talking about today, ghosts are kind of a problem, uh, and they are in medieval literature generally. Uh, there's not a terrible amount of room in Christian eschatology for ghosts, because there really shouldn't be anyone hanging around on earth after death. You should probably be sorted into one place or the other. Uh, St. Augustine, for example, in uh, his book on the care of the dead, writes that ghosts don't really exist at all. They're either sendings from God or from uh, or they're demonic uh, entities taking the form of spirits. But this the doctrine of purgatory helps so- solve that a little bit. Ghosts are usually like Hamlet's father, people who are given temporary dispensation to leave purgatory, or in this text that we're going to be talking about, they are suffering in kind of a separate special purgatory made just for them in the place where they committed their greatest sin. So the spirit, the ghost in this text is exactly that. He is a man who dies in France in the 14th century and comes back to haunt his wife in their house where they committed some kind of sin that's never clearly specified, but seems to be sexual in nature uh, and has temporary leave to serve out his purgatorial sentence in his bedroom, uh, specifically around his bed, rather than in sort of the general common purgatory. Okay. You you mentioned uh, the ghost of Hamlet's father, and that's, of course, a famous example of a ghost turning up in, in Christian literature, even arguably Catholic literature, if, if that's how you view Shakespeare. But it sounds like the tradition of ghosts turning up in Christian texts has got a much longer history, and, and the ghost of Hamlet's father stands at the end of a tradition rather than being something which is distinctive in its own right. Yeah, very much so. Actually, I think Stephen Greenblatt in his book on Hamlet touches on some of that and tries to place it in a broader tradition of purgatorial literature, and which is useful to me because he's one of the very few scholars who have paid any attention to the text that I'm talking about at all. But yes, Hamlet's father is pretty typical of uh, medieval literature, even though showing up in the early modern period in his, his abilities to turn up on earth for only a short period of time. So he's limited to showing up only until the cock crows, which of course is a famous folkloric and ancient tradition that demons, spirits, monsters only have until the cock crows to wander the earth, uh, and his his delivering some kind of message. So one of the things that I talk about in my work on the Gast of Ghee and on, on ghosts generally is how ghosts always demand interpretation. They always have some kind of unfinished business. This is true everywhere from Pliny's letter to Sura, where he writes about a philosopher who spends a night in a haunted house that nobody else will spend any time in uh, and encounters a spirit who is rattling chains and wrapped in a cloth. So one of the the great sources for most of our traditions about ghosts uh, and the ghost beckons him with a single, with, with, a, with a gesture, he follows the spirit out. The ghost points to the ground. And the next morning, the philosopher has the ground dug up and finds an old man, the skeleton of an old man, uh, shackled with chains and once he's properly laid to rest the ghost doesn't trouble the home anymore so ghosts always have some kind of unfinished business and that's usually some kind of message to get across and this is true often in even mo- uh, many modern ghost stories so there are tales for example of ghosts showing up or appearing in people's dreams and gesturing at a, a particular place on the wall which when knocked down reveals some kind of money perhaps ill-gotten or just meant to be passed on to the next of kin There's a very famous case in the United States where a ghost allegedly helped solve a murder by revealing details of her killing to her mother. 
So ghosts usually have some kind of message stayed across. Obviously, that's what Hamlet's father does in telling his son of the of the nature of his death uh, and his betrayal by his brothers. So it's it's pretty emblematic of of that kind of tradition. Okay, okay. Well, let's let's focus in on this text, the Gast of Guy, isn't it? This is a Middle English text. Is that is that right? Yeah, it's actually three Middle English texts. There are three different translations of this. It seems to have been a pretty popular text. It's based on a Latin text, De Spiritu Guidonis, which uh, claims to have been written by a prior Jean Gobi in France at the very beginning of the 14th century. 1324 is the events that these uh, this is supposed to depict. So it's allegedly based on a true story. The author of the Latin original writes as though uh, this really took place, gives a specific time and place uh, where these individuals experienced these hauntings. And then this was translated into Middle English a few decades later. I happen to focus on one particular translation of it because it happens to be the most widely available. It was edited uh, for the Middle English text series, but it was translated into a number of different vernaculars, including French. And there are three different versions in English, which mostly differ by their uh, versification. So so this was quite a widely read text, and it wasn't something that's someone just wrote in a, in, in a monastery scriptorium somewhere and just filed away to be discovered by modern scholars. Yeah, it seems to have been pretty popular uh, in contrast to its often underread nature uh, nowadays. And it kind of makes sense for why it is. It's got a pretty exciting story. A ghost showing up in someone's bedroom is interesting. But ghosts are also a great opportunity to expand any kind of doctrinal points of unclarity. So you can ask ghosts a lot of questions about what happens to the soul after death or how we ought to live. And any messages they give have a very particular kind of authority to them because they were delivered, of course, by a spirit. Um, So this seems to have been pretty popular for its didactic nature and for its ability to clarify some points of doctrine with the authority of its having come from a a messenger from the world of the dead. Okay. So as as to the narrative of this text, what actually happens? Can you take us through that? Yeah, it's pretty bare bones in terms of plot. We're told that a man, uh, Guy or Guy, dies in France in a small town. And then not long after his death, he starts appearing to his wife for certain definitions of appear. He is throughout the whole text bodiless. He never manifests himself physically. He's just sounds. Uh, So he's just voices and noises. Uh, for his wife, he's just noises. He uh, takes the form of a strange cacophony that's heard in their bedroom every single night. Eventually, this quite understandably drives her to distress, and she shows up at the local Dominican priory, which dispatches the three men, Jean Gobi, presumably, although he's not named in the Middle English version, uh, and two other priests to the house. Uh, and they take a sort of interesting precaution. They not quite barricade the doors, but they, they get a bunch of men from the neighboring town they have them confess, they give them the host, and then they place them in groups of three around the building as though that would somehow offer any protection against an incorporeal spirit. And then the priest simply goes in and begins talking to the ghost. He conjures him in the name of Christ and commands him to speak with him. And for the first time, Guy does in fact manifest as something that can have communication uh, rather than just as incoherent noises. Although again, he never physically appears. He's just sounds. Uh, And there are a couple of interesting medieval depictions of this where you can see priests, uh, artistic depictions where you can see priests having quite animated conversations with thin air. Uh, So even in visual forms, he never he never uh, manifests. Uh, And so once that's done, the priest bids him to explain what he is and where he's from. Uh, And his chief concern, the priest's chief concern is determining whether this is a good ghost or a bad ghost. So a lot has been written, including by Nancy Cacciola, on the problem of the discernment of spirits in the Middle Ages. She's more focused on possession, uh, but how do you tell if what you're dealing with is a good spirit or a bad spirit, if it's something from God or something from the devil? And that's a real concern here as well. How do we know that this is actually the spirit of this man who's passed away and not some kind of demon who could lead us astray? Since again, we're going to be asking him doctrinal questions if we don't know if this is in fact the man we believe it to be, or if it's some kind of demon, we could be in real danger of uh, taking bad doctrine under consideration. So he's really concerned with telling whether or not this is a a good spirit or a bad spirit. He tries to catch him out at a few points. So there's a constant back and forth between them where the priest tries to find any inconsistencies in Guy's spirit. He puts him to some tests, like he hides a, a consecrated host under his shirt and then asks Guy if he can see it. 
And then as he goes on, he becomes more and more convinced that this is in fact the man that he, that he says he is. And so he goes through some more doctrinal questions asking about purgatory. How is it that you are here in this bedroom and not in purgatory where you by rights ought to be and sort of progresses through a dialogue of that nature? One thing that sticks out from this is the fact that the, the priest conjures the ghost. He summons him up. This sounds like an act of ritual magic, clerical magic. Yeah, it's pretty common in interactions with ghosts, at least in the Middle Ages. It kind of falls out in modern ghost stories, for example. Nobody who meets a ghost ever says, I conjure thee in the name of Christ, at least outside of um, maybe more Catholic literature. But it's pretty common for encounters with a ghost to command it to speak uh, in the name of Christ, sometimes actually using the word conjure. So in another famous Middle, Middle English ghost story, The On Tears of Arthur, where Gawain and Guinevere, who's called Gainer in the text, encounter a really horrific wailing spirit that's skeletal in form, shrouded in almost tangible darkness, has toads chewing on its face. Gawain kind of broadly, uh, uh, bravely walks up to it and says, I conjure thee speak with me. And that always works. It's a very ritualized act. It's, it's a borderline magical act. Again, it usually invo- involves the actual word conjure, and it's always done in the name of God or Christ, uh, more specifically. And it results in the ghost usually kind of settling down to speak with them, in this case, to transition from being this wordless cacophony to being a, an intelligent, sensible creature that you can speak with. It, it shades into exorcism, doesn't it? It definitely does. And there are some other strange uh, ritualistic elements in this text. As I I mentioned, the uh, placing men in groups of three, presumably to betoken the Trinity around the household. It's not really clear what armed men would, how they would be any good against an incorporeal spirit, but it does serve to demarcate the haunted house from the area around it. So it's almost kind of, uh, and in my article on this, I make the connection, almost kind of drawing a magic circle around it or creating a kind of boundary between the inner world of the house where the supernatural events are taking place and the outer world where they are sealed off from. Sort of uh, when Moses goes up to Sinai to speak with God, there's a similar boundary drawing. So God places an explicit limit on where the people of Israel should not transgress lest they die. They cannot get any, there's an invisible line between the mountain uh, and the rest of the world around it. And that's kind of the case here too. There's a boundary demarcated between the space of the supernatural where there's going to be an encounter between this world and the other and the external mundane world where that shouldn't shouldn't transgress or break out and nobody should break in. Okay, okay. And as to what the ghost reveals, what, what does he tell us about the afterlife? He has some interesting views on purgatory in particular. Uh, so I mentioned how much of an issue ghosts are sort of doctrinally for Christians and certainly for medieval Catholicism, which tried pretty mightily to labor and figure out a solution to this. Uh, And the author of the Gast of Ghee or the spirit himself, uh, depending on whose authority you want to lay this at the feet of, has an interesting solution that doesn't show up an awful lot in other texts. He has the idea that there is a common purgatory, which seems to be under the earth. And that is where most people are. That is what we think of as purgatory. And then there is what he calls a purgatory departable, which is a particular place on earth as I mentioned, usually the place where the purgatorial soul committed some kind of particularly great sin, where they're given temporary leave to serve out their sentence there. I mentioned the Auntiers of Arthur. There's something similar at play there. They encounter the, a ghost that turns out to be the ghost of Guinevere's mother, who seems to be serving out her sentence underneath the surface of a lake, the Tarn Waddling, which seems to have been an area of particularly heightened supernatural activity because it shows up in a couple of other medieval texts. It's not really clear what sin she might have committed there, if there's some kind of the same logic at work there that she's serving out her sentence there because it was a place of transgression. But that's one of the more interesting ideas that the spirit reveals. The priest is kind of at some pains to ask questions about when the world is going to end, when the Antichrist will show up. And he's actually rebuked by the ghost for that. The ghost says basically that there are things that you shouldn't ask and matters you shouldn't look into. And when the world is going to end is one of them. And other than that, he lays out some pretty standard medieval doctrine about purgatory and about spirits. So that uh, masses, almsgiving, prayers for the souls of the dead are very efficacious in speeding the soul's progress through purgatory. 
and hastening them on their journey towards salvation, uh, on the efficacy of the host and of the validity of priestly orders. It's some pretty standard medieval doctrine in those areas, but it's noteworthy for its its emphasis on, as I mentioned, that kind of dual purgatory that we don't see showing up in a lot of places. Yeah, with with a text like that, the question always arises, doesn't it? Whose agenda is the author selling? Is this a, a work that's intended to try to float a new idea or a new theory about the afterlife? Or is this essentially defensive of, of orthodoxy? It sounds like this is someone who had a, a new idea about purgatory divided into two locations and that they were using the medium of a story to try and po- promulgate that belief. Yeah, it is a pretty innovative idea, and it's an elegant solution to the problem of ghosts within a Catholic framework. It's also noteworthy for the time that it's being put forward. So this is, as I mentioned, written in somewhere around uh, 1324. The events it, it recounts allegedly took place in 1323. And then it was presented sometime either in 24 or 1325 to Pope John the 22nd at Avignon. Pope John was flirting with the idea of dormition or soul sleep, the idea that the dead, even those in a, in, who die in a state of grace, wouldn't participate in the beatic vision, so wouldn't have a vision of God, essentially wouldn't really get into heaven until after the last judgment. And that's one of the ideas that he explicitly refutes. He is very clear on the fact that those who die in a state of grace or serve out their purgation will uh, participate in the beatic vision, will see God long before the last judgment. So if we're talking about agendas, there is a pretty clear, it seems to me, agenda in refuting this idea that the Pope was flirting with at the time. Uh, And then it's also very much clear in its clerical agenda. So the text really goes out of its way to verify the importance of clerics. There's a bit early on in the poem where it sort of lays out a hierarchy that stretches from St. Michael the Archangel down through the doctors of the church and learned masters, and then clerics, and then finally unlearned men or lewd men, as the text calls them, lewd men that don't have learning. Uh, And so priests are placed in this kind of angelic hierarchy where they have a clear role of learning and disseminating knowledge and preaching to the general populace and incorporating them into the same hierarchy through their teaching and through their preaching. So very much a clerical agenda in the text, which is not surprising given its origin. Yeah, the, the, the fact that this comes out at the time that John the Twenty Second is putting forward his ideas about the afterlife sounds like it's very significant. Because, of course, John the Twenty Second is a fairly well-known case, or at least well-known amongst people who concern themselves with these things, of a pope who appeared to fall into heresy. It was something of a scandal at the time. It created debate and it created controversy. It sounds like this text is part of that ongoing debate, which is raging around what the Pope had tried to teach. Yeah, I don't think it's possible to separate this text from that broader conversation. I think it's really important uh, to the author, and it's one of the main things motivating him, is to refute that particular idea that the Pope was flirting with. Obviously, the text never attributes it to the Pope, uh, and John isn't mentioned in any of those conversations, although we are told that the text was presented to him. But it definitely seems like it's motivated by an engagement with this real issue that was really troubling the church at the time and was, after John the Twenty Second's death, very explicitly refuted by the magisterium that, no, in fact, those who die in a state of grace can proceed to the beatific vision without waiting until the last judgment. And it shows some of the real doctrinal problems of this particular time period, especially around purgatory and especially around the fate of the soul after death. Uh, This was really a hotbed of contention at the time. And I guess if you're going to try and refute the Pope, then the only higher authority that you have is someone who's actually a visitor from the afterlife and can speak from personal experience. Yeah, ghosts, as I mentioned, have a really particular authority to them. And that's why it's so essential to determine whether what you're speaking with is actually the ghost that it's claiming to be. Uh, In this case, as I said, Guy de Corvo is the man's full name. Uh, And so this text is pretty interesting for its very detailed specificity on where and when this took place. We're told the man's full name, Guy de Corvo. We're told the town it took place in. We're told the specific year it took place in. And we're told the prior who says that he wrote the text, Sean Gobi, and the general circumstances in which the text was written. So it has a pretty clear chain of evidence or chain of custody, uh, really trying hard to establish its bona fides uh, and its origin and place it in as much detail as we can, 
so that we can put as much trust as possible in this particular spirit. So it's not vague on any of the details about where and when this ghost was met or what he taught uh, or how we can be sure that he is a good spirit and not a bad one. So this is a text which is framed as a true story. It's not self-consciously using the format of a story to make a point. It's actually claiming to be an almost journalistic report of an event that took place. Yeah, it really wants us to have faith in it as a journalistic account. So very often encounters with ghosts are sort of vague about the details. This is a story that was handed down. This was something that happened to a friend of a friend or is written in an old text. But here we have a story that was allegedly written by the man who actually met the spirit. We have other witnesses mentioned alongside him. He wasn't alone in the house. He had two other men from the priory accompanying him dispatched by the bishop of the diocese. We have the witnesses of the townspeople who were placed around the house. It's not clear whether they heard everything that went on inside the house, the full extent of the dialogue between Jean Gobi and the ghast of Guy, the ghost of Guy, but they certainly heard something. They hear noises inside the house at various points. They're either terrified or trying to rush in uh, and see what's going on. Of course, they're disappointed because nobody sees anything. As I said, this is a ghost that only appears through word and sound. But we have as much detail as we can if we needed to verify this story. So it's really trying hard to have us believe in it as a journalistic account, as something that happened in a particular time and place to specific people, uh, rather than a sort of vague story. I'm probably clutching at straws here, but is there any other evidence that this event took place? Are there any other contemporary sources that, that mention that this happened? This seems to be the only account of it. We do know that the author who wrote it was a real person, so we know that there was a Jean Gobi. There isn't any evidence other than this that he was actually a prior. I'm inclined to take his word for it, but he certainly was a Dominican who did live at the time and the place that this text says he lives. But as for other accounts of this story, this seems to be the only one that survives, if any other were ever written. So we really do just have Jean Gobi's word for it. Okay, okay. And going back to the agenda that the text is selling. One thing that we've already touched on is the role of the priest in the text. The priest is essentially a mediator figure, isn't he? Yeah, there's a lot of importance laid on the figure of the priest as mediator. As I mentioned, he is the link in that angelic hierarchy between the common people uh, and ultimately God himself. He is also the only figure privileged with the ability to talk to the ghost and to interpret its messages. So obviously the wife was the first point of contact. And there might be some interesting parallels there between Christ, the fact that Christ first appeared to the women at the tomb before then appearing to the apostles after his resurrection. But unlike Christ, he doesn't deliver any messages to his wife. His wife only experiences him as terrifying noises in the middle of the night. It's only the priest who, as I said, conjures him in specific language. He says, I conjure thee who has the privilege of talking with the ghost and actually getting messages out of him. I mentioned those men placed around the house and the possibility that they might be there not just to keep the ghost in, which it doesn't seem that they would be very effective at doing, but to keep the community out. So Jean Jean Claude Smith has a very famous book aptly titled Ghosts in the Middle Ages, where he writes for the tendency for an entire community to take hold of ghostly events. Uh, So to take interpretive dominion over the visitation from a spirit uh, and to make it public property rather than, as it seems to be in this text, church property. And so it seems like the armed men might be there to prevent exactly that happening, to make sure that this remains the domain of the priests. In my approach to this text and to ghostly visitations in the Middle Ages generally, I try to approach the priest as a kind of figure of Hermes. So, of course, Hermes was a god of ghosts and boundaries. He's probably most famous as a messenger god. He was the messenger of Zeus specifically, who bears communications from Olympus down to the common world. But he was also very much a figure of boundaries. So herms, which are sort of pillars with carved heads at the top often, would be placed as boundary markers. Figures of Hermes would be placed at the limen, at the door between the internal, the inside of the house and the outside. And All the way back from the classical period, you have writers interpreting Hermes as a go-between. So obviously you have the etymology proposed for Hermenuin or for hermeneutics as relating to the word, to the name Hermes. This also works in Latin. So Arnobius of Sicus, who's a fourth century Christian apologist, repeats an etymology of Varro, where the word medicurius is proposed as the origin for mercury. Medicurius seems to mean something like between runner or go-between. 
uh, but he is the god of going between. Frank Kermode picks up on this and uses Hermes as the an emblem of the figure who goes between the text and the reader, between the latent and the manifest, uh, or the surface and the obscure sense of texts, and of course, between the living and the dead. And so I propose looking at the priest as doing sort of the same thing. He is obviously, as I said, the figure who goes between this intrusion of the other world into the mundane and the world outside of it. He's also the one who interprets it by writing it up uh, and by presenting it to the outside world. And of course, he is the figure who has to interpret the ghost himself by interrogating him, uh, by practicing Paul's discernment of spirits and interpreting whether he is a good spirit or an ill and in interpreting his message in carrying out the questioning of this ghost and interpreting the doctrinal messages that he has and then spreading them to the outside world. And then, of course, he's also the one who's responsible for laying the ghost. So Hermes is also a psychopomp. He, in the final book of the Odyssey, is the one who leads the souls of the massacred suitors down to the other world. And at least in literary depictions, Hermes uh, or Mercury was called upon in the necromantic raising of ghosts. So he seems to be responsible for leading them up from the other world as well as down to the other world. And the priest, of course, while not quite that dramatic, has a similar role by performing masses uh, on Guy's behalf, which he does after his first encounter with the ghost. He is responsible for speeding Guy's progression through the, the other world and into his final resting place in heaven. So he has a responsibility for helping to escort Guy through purgatory uh, and into the final world beyond. Anybody can give alms and pray for the dead, but masses, as Guy tells us, are particularly efficacious at alleviating uh, those sufferings and speeding them out of purgatory. And that is what the priest in this tale, Jean Gobi in the original Latin, does after he talks with Guy the first time, he lays out precisely which and how many masses should be celebrated for the souls of the dead. Uh, the prior then goes out and sings them in even greater numbers than Guy had requested. And there's a kind of curious bit of proof here. He tells the priest, both as proof that these masses are efficacious and as proof that he really is what he says to be and not a demon taking the form of this dead man, he tells him to revisit after revisit the house on a specific day uh, after Easter and after these masses have been celebrated. And you won't find me here, he says. So the proof that this really happened is that there is no ghost when they return. And that serves as evidence of the fact that the masses were efficacious, that Guy is no longer serving out his term of purgatory in this home, but has in fact progressed on to his final rest. The overall message that I'm getting from this text is that it's essentially conservative. It's presenting a very high view of the clerical state. It's bolstering priestly authority, and it's defending traditional ideas about the afterlife against John the 22nd's speculations. Would that be fair to say? Yes, absolutely. And I think that might be partly responsible for the general lack of scholarly interest is that there isn't as much, there really isn't any innovation being presented here, except as I, I said, for that strange idea about common purgatory and purgatory departable. The rest of the doctrine that we're presented with in this text is quite conservative and very familiar to anybody who has read medieval Catholic doctrine. There really isn't any innovation here. And in fact, it's a conservative defense against John the 22nd, who was attempting to present some innovation. Uh, so there really aren't any messages that the ghost carries that are surprising or shocking. Everything that, that he tells us about the real presence of Christ in the host, the validity of prayers to the Virgin Mary, the efficacy of, of masses and almsgiving for speeding souls through purgatory is pretty common stuff. Uh, even the message where the priest is rebuked for asking questions about the end of the world or seeking into knowledge that he shouldn't have is pretty common. In fact, exorcists today, modern Catholic exorcists are instructed not to ask those kinds of questions. Uh, if you are dealing with a demon uh, that you are trying to exercise, you should not ask things like when the world will end or how the Antichrist will manifest on earth. There are things that are off limits. So that's, that's an idea that goes straight from Guy up until the modern period. So aside again from that bit about the two purgatories, there isn't anything surprising or innovative here. It's a pretty conservative text doctrinally. And in that context, is it significant that the Dominicans are tied up with this, the Dominicans being associated with doctrinal orthodoxy? 
I think so. Uh, and the Dominicans had a particular role to play in the doctrine of uh, purgatory. So the Dominicans even today consider the prayers for the souls of the dead in purgatory to be one of their special devotions. There are other orders manifest here when the prior goes back, as I said, at the end to verify that Guy isn't there. Uh, he's accompanied by uh, monks from other orders. Uh, so we have multiple branches represented, but the Dominicans are the ones leading the charge. Obviously, Jean Gobi is a Dominican, and he's uh, responsible for this text being presented to John the Twenty Second. So it seems like they're serving a, a traditionally conservative role here in defending standard doctrine against innovation uh, or divergence or heresy. Okay, and as to the afterlife of the text, as opposed to the afterlife of Guy, it was quite a widely read text. It was clearly something that generated some interest in its own time. Is it a text that continues to be read in later centuries and continues to influence people then? Because it seems to me that this idea of a double purgatory didn't didn't really catch on. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have a terribly long afterlife following its being written in the 14th century. As I said, it was pretty popular at the time. It was translated into uh, a number of vernaculars, into French and into English multiple times. So we have at least three different versions in English, but it hasn't been widely loved since. And that's probably because of its conservative nature, because it's pretty thin on plot. As I said, it's not a very exciting text to read if you don't have a particular interest in eschatology or in medieval Catholic doctrine. And in that, it's kind of different from a lot of other medieval ghost stories that have caught on uh, and remains popular. The Auntiers of Arthur, as I said, the ghost in that is a really terrifying figure who happens to run into the Knights of the Round Table, uh, or in some of the better known medieval ghost stories, like those of the Monk of Byland, where you have ghosts appearing in odd forms as revenants, so semi-embodied physical forms more like zombies than our traditional idea of ghosts. This is never a really frightening text. It doesn't seem like it's trying to elicit any particular excitement uh, or fear in the reader. As I said, Guy never even appears. He's just a voice. And so all of that might, might account for the fact that it's not been a very widely loved or read text in later centuries. Uh, the Reformation probably has some responsibility for that as well, because obviously in Protestant countries, ideas about the nature of the soul after death change such that this account from the spirit is not something that would remain popular. But even modern scholars uh, have been kind of slow to rediscover it. That's been changing. It was edited not terribly long ago in 2004 for the Middle English text series, which gives it a much wider availability. It's it, at least one version of it. Uh, the Mets version is available free online to anybody to read. Uh, and a few later scholars, a few recent scholars have tried to approach the text, but it isn't something that that retains a particularly privileged place in the modern imagination or even the early modern imagination, despite its apparent early popularity when it's first written. Okay. Well, you've you've written an article about this, which we'll put in the show notes. Is your dissertation likewise going to be focusing on this or are you broadening out your, your focus to other texts as well? So the article that I've written is going to make up part of the third chapter of my dissertation, which is going to broaden its scope. This article is very specifically focused on this particular text. But one of the things I try to do in that chapter is look at other medieval ghost stories and exa again, examining the role of the priest as the particular mediator between this world and the other. Uh, so there are a number of other texts that we can look at. The Prioress's Tale by Chaucer uh, in the Canterbury Tales, one of the more famous for many of the wrong reasons. It's a deeply anti-Semitic tale about a young boy who is murdered by uh, Jews in his city uh, and seems to draw inspiration from Little St. Hugh of Lincoln, who was likewise a child that was killed uh, and his death was laid at the feet of the Jews, although there's no evidence that any of that took place. It's about a child who was murdered uh, and thrown in a heap. And then his body, even though his throat is cut, begins singing. So this was a boy, we're told, who had a particular devotion to the Virgin Mary. He begins singing. And once a priest is called out and encounters the boy, he again calls on him to speak. And the boy recounts uh, what happens to him and helps bring a sort of justice to those accused. But there are a lot of tales in which the priest has a particular role in encountering the spirit and in laying it to rest and in interpreting its message. It's an interesting point of comparison with tales where that doesn't happen, where there isn't a priest involved. I keep mentioning the Auntiers of Arthur. There's no priest in that story. It's just Gawain and Guinevere who encounter the ghost. And, they, and although they do get it to speak and they do have it explain why it's in this lake and what it wants uh, and what happened to it, 
it's noteworthy for the lack of real communication or understanding that takes place between these two laymen and the spirit. It's a kind of remarkable dialogue, Gawain and Guinevere and the ghost speaking to one, to one another, for the fact that they're constantly talking past one another. There seems to be no real communication between the other world uh, and the mundane world. The ghost is at pains to stress to Guinevere that she should take better care of the poor, that she should be mindful of her own mortality, especially when she is, for example, sitting at feasts to remember the hungry. The very next scene in the story is Guinevere and the rest of the round table sitting at a feast, and there's no mention of remembering the hungry or feeding the poor. Uh, so the only thing that, that happens, the only successful communication is that at the very end of the text, Guinevere does have masses sung for her mother's soul, but the rest of the ghost's message seems to completely go astray. It's not internalized by Gawain or Guinevere. And that might be because there isn't a priestly interpreter there. There isn't somebody like Jean Gobi in this text who can really interrogate the spirit, uh, de determine its message, and then disseminate it in writing uh, or in preaching for a wider audience. So that's those are the sorts of things I'm looking at in this dissertation is ghostly encounters generally uh, and the specific mechanisms by which they're interpreted, by which they're understood and ultimately laid to rest. And are there other examples of medieval ghost stories in which a priest is involved as a mediator? Yeah, uh, one of the more famous examples in addition to the Priorist's tale might be St. Erkenwald, uh, which is a kind of a, it's a very unusual tale in which a body is discovered it beneath the uh, building of St. Paul's in London. It mystifies the general community because it seems to be a very fresh corpse. Uh, and he's very richly arrayed in beautiful fabrics. He's in a very extravagant and elaborate tomb, and yet nobody knows who he is or why he would be laid to rest there. There's also some writing on the side of the tomb that nobody can read, and it kind of throws the whole city into turmoil because there's a, this failure of communal memory to know who this is or why he's buried right beneath the floor. St. Erkenwald comes back. He realizes that the, the community has failed to understand who this is. They've searched through books. They've searched through records. Uh, they've searched through the memories of the people in the town, and there's no explanation for this. So he takes the quite natural step of just asking the body who he is, and again, successfully conjures him to speak. And the dead body does indeed begin to speak and explains his role, uh, his identity. In fact, he's much, much older than anybody had previously thought. He's from before the time of Christ and has been miraculously preserved up until this point. And so he's stuck in a kind of limbo where he was a good man who adhered to the law of his time, sort of the best of what a pagan could be, but he died before the incarnation of Christ. And so he can't really be saved because he hasn't been baptized. And there's a very dramatic scene at the end of that text where St. Erkenwald sheds a single tear on the corpse and that counts as his baptism. The body immediately crumbles into dust and the spirit is freed. Uh, but that's another classic example of the priest being the mediator uh, between this world and the other in interpreting this, this total riddle of what this body is and why he has been preserved and then in escorting the spirit from limbo into uh, salvation. It seems to me that ghosts offered quite a convenient way of exploring knotty theological problems. It's a bit like modern science fiction where other worlds and aliens are used as a route into exploring problems that concern people here and now. Yeah, and ghosts are a really convenient vehicle for doing that. Uh, you don't have an awful lot of different kind of otherworldly visitors. Uh, so you have the occasional angel, you have an awful lot of demons, but obviously you can't trust what they say. And angelic visitations or visitations of the Virgin Mary or even of God himself uh, are limited in their scope to only a few very particular people. You have to be a mystic or a saint uh, in order to be gifted with that kind of vision. Whereas ghosts have a much wider currency. Lots of people have seen ghosts, or at least believe they have, and lots of people now as then know somebody who says that they have seen a ghost. So ghosts have sort of a broader cultural cachet in that they're more accessible to common people. So ghosts do have quite a secure place in historical Catholic cosmology. Yeah, even if they're sometimes a little bit naughty as to why they would be showing up in a particular house rather than sticking to purgatory as they ought to, ghosts have a really privileged place as visitors from purgatory uh, who can serve out a really important role in verifying that doctrine and in verifying the efficacy of, of prayers for the dead. Okay, well, that sounds like a good place to leave things, as unfortunately we're now out of time. Alex Sawaki, thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. You have been
been listening to Religion Off the Beaten Track with Robin Douglas. Remember to follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you.